The 1970s, an escape into trends. Trends were born in the 70s. But what were people escaping from? Well, let's take a look at the world of the 70s and you'll see that it was a rather scary and bleak landscape. First of all, the Vietnam War was still raging. The Vietnam War wouldn't end until the mid-1970s, so all of that peaceful protesting by those lovely folk with flowers in their hair didn't do much good, did it? And speaking of those student and young protesters, well, that all took a rather sinister turn in the early 1970s, too. There were a series of anarchist student or dropout or ex-hippie groups who were terrorist groups like these folk here. They were based out of Germany, which is why their wanted poster is in German, but their acts of terrorism were international. This is the Beide Meinhof group. What did they want? Well, they wanted social change. They wanted the war in Vietnam to end. They wanted um, an equal distribution of wealth. They wanted civil equality. They wanted all of this stuff, but they didn't go about it in peaceful ways. They went about it in terrible ways, by blowing things up, by planting car bombs, by kidnapping people, by killing people. Equally no notorious were the Symbionese Liberation Army. That is their symbol there. They were an American group of young anarchists slightly more aimless in their intent than the Beider Meinhof group. And they were particularly famous for kidnapping this girl here. This is Patty Hearst. She was the heiress, the young, beautiful heiress to the billion dollar William Randolph Hearst fortune. They kidnapped her for ransom. But guess what? She fell in love with them and fell in with them. And this is a very famous photograph of her posing in her anarchy uh, gear. In Britain, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, also conducted a series of awful terrorist attacks on mainland England in London, putting bombs in cars, in pubs, in toy departments. Terrifying, awful stuff. And the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, Hit up. They would uh, uh, hijack planes, either blow them up on the runway, uh, kill people. Oh, it was horrible. Just this wave of terrorism. Terrorism is not a new thing. I am recording this lecture in November 2015. And as I was putting the final touches on it a couple of days ago, the news came through of the ISIS attacks in Paris. And it seems so strange that I was just putting this lecture together, talking about terrorism, and, and then uh, that news came through. What else? The oil crisis, the gas shortage. There was an enormous shortage of gas and oil and fossil fuel in the early 1970s because of the issues in the Middle East. So Americans ran out of gas. It was very rash, and look at this, sorry, no gas. Americans without cars, that was bleak. Of course, it was the era of Watergate. Our president, President Richard Nixon, also known as Tricky Dicky, uh, did something awful. He illegally put bugs, listening devices, not cockroaches, into the rooms and uh, conference halls of the Democratic conference at the Watergate Hotel and Conference Center in Washington, D.C. He was a Republican, so he was spying on his political opponents. This was all revealed. He denied doing it, and of course it's terribly illegal and not very sporting. But then a couple of journalists from the Washington Post proved that he did do it, and so rather than be impeached, he resigned. But oh my God, this was so demoralizing and humiliating for America. What else was happening in this cheerful decade? Oh, for example, the Jonestown Massacre. A crazy preacher from San Francisco uh, took his congregation to Guyana in South America in the jungle to start a community that was supposed to be idyllic. 
And then it all went horribly wrong, and he forced his congregation to drink Kool-Aid laced with um, cyanide. Here it says 400 dead in Guyana, the, the total was actually more like 1,000. This was scary and awful, but it kind of showed how disenfranchised people were feeling to want to go and uh, start a new life in Guyana with a crazy preacher. What else? In 1975, I believe it was, the FBI coined a new phrase, a phrase that has become very familiar to us, serial killer. There had always been serial killers, but in the 1970s, there was suddenly an explosion of serial killers like Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, uh, Son of Sam, I could go on and on naming 70s serial killers. Again, this shows that after the hope and optimism of the 60s, everything went horribly wrong, and that by the time we hit the 70s, people are feeling very disenfranchised. And yet the smiley face was the symbol of the era, but it was used ironically, as was, I think, the phrase of the era, have a nice day. Fashion is not an island, it's a response. And fashion responded with a series of trends that added glamour or sweetness or just plain fun to a gloomy and really frightening landscape. So, let's take a look. As we always do, let's start with the body ideal. Here is the body ideal of the 70s. Willowy, you all know what that means don't you? Willowy. Sort of delicate, like a willow tree. Small, with natural breasts, a taut waistline, slim hips, very natural physique, no corsets, no girdles, and often no bra. This small, delicate figure was perfect for every single one of the varying trends of the era. It was great for the laid-back, casual uh, look that we associate with the 70s and that ran throughout the decade. It was also great for the pantsuit. Again, this would run throughout the decade, as would the incredibly popular gypsy trend. Sometimes it was called gypsy, sometimes it was peasant, but it was this look. And this little body looked perfect in all of these varying trends. Who had this body? Well, lots of people did who were famous and popular. Stevie Nicks, the lead singer of uh, Fleetwood Mac, she had this body. Bianca Jagger, she was married to Mick Jagger. She was a bit of an it girl on the party scene in the 70s. She had this delicate willowy body. Farrah Fawcett had this body, of course, from Charlie's Angels. And as we move into the end of the decade, we'll meet Debbie Harry, the lead singer of the punk new wave band Blondie. She had this body. So you can see, all of these women are very different types, and actually, now that I look at this drop, all of them are speaking to so many of the popular trends of the 70s, and yet they all have very similar physiques. Now, we usually do the uh, beauty ideal, don't we, after we do the body ideal, but because there were so many different makeup looks in the 1970s to achieve these uh, various uh, fantasies that people escaped into, we'll do the makeup looks as we go along. And at this point, we usually discuss the dominant fashion idea, don't we? But here's the thing. The 70s was the time of trends, so there were many fashion ideas. So instead of the dominant fashion idea, we really have to talk about all of the little fashion ideas that made up this overarching era of trends. Here are just some of them. The feminine gypsy, the liberated pantsuit, simple and slinky, chilled out denim, 
super sporty. Take a look at all of these images. They all scream 70s, don't they? But they are all incredibly different. So all of these looks coexisted throughout the decade, varying slightly from year to year, but all linked by a dominant and rather revolutionary idea in fashion. Comfort. We see comfort for the first time. Okay, people didn't wear um, corsets or girdles with mini skirts, but a little micro mini skirt, you always had to be careful that your pants weren't showing. You always had to be careful how you sat. Really, from the end of the 60s into the 70s, we uh, give up the idea of changing our bodies through corsetry or girdles. Comfort. But this suited the 70s. There was so much conflict in the world. We wanted comfort. We didn't want to have to encounter conflict with our own bodies every time we got dressed. And so this era is really when this idea of comfort wear, leisure wear, almost active wear before that term was ever um, used, came about. Take a look here, sort of a flared comfy je jeans and a, a hoodie before the word hoodie was used actually, comfort. Although, as you just saw, there were many different silhouettes, all of them linked by comfort, there was sort of an overarching shape theme in the 70s. Things got terribly wide, terribly wide. Flares, we associate flares with the 70s, very wide. Collars got wide. Lapels got wide. Ties got wide hair got wide. It was a wide decade. But before we go on and look at some of the more beautiful, interesting and exciting trends that make up the big fashion story of the 70s, I have to talk about textiles. Textiles were the reason that so many of the more beautiful trends of the 70s simply did not translate by the time they reached a mass market. Because the mass market was in love with polyester. This was the polyester decade. Look at these people, all in polyester. Here's some more polyester. Now you see this... Uh, ensemble here, believe it or not, if this had been conjured up by a European designer, the, the blouse would have been silk, the pants would have been jersey, it would not have been in those colours, it would have been beautiful. Here's a, a nicer polyester ensemble for you. Think about things like the maxi skirt. By the time it reached the American mass market, it was made of polyester or something equally revolting, which made it stiff and bulky and simply not sexy. When the maxi appeared in Europe, it was made of silk or jersey. It was slinky. It was sexy. So this is why there are two very, very different views of 70s fashion. When we think of the mainstream, it's awful. It's risible. You all know what risible means, right? It means laughable. And we like to make fun of it. And yet, when we look at high fashion or really trendy streetwear of the 70s, it's gorgeous. And the reason really is textiles. And also because trends were moving so quickly, there were so many of them. By the time a trend had happened, was clocked, and was over in Europe. It was only just beginning to kick off in the mainstream. And this is true for the New York designers who would appear in the 70s as well. By the time their beautiful, elegant, minimalist work hit mass retail, it had been completely misunderstood and something awful had taken its place. So the 70s was dichotomous. It's one of my favorite fashion decades but I think it might be my worst as well. 
Because there were so many trends that overlapped and ran in one incarnation or another throughout the decade, we will tell the story of 70s fashion through the dominant looks of the decade. The designers of the decade we'll discuss are those whose names are associated with a particular 70s trend. Those who either did it first or simply did it best. And the style icons I've chosen are the people who best exemplified the trend, whose look was most imitated by the masses and whose name is forever locked in to a particular cultural moment. This is going to be fun. And in true 70s fashion biz style, I will give each of our 70s dominant trends a suitably buzzword type of title. The first of our dominant 70s trends is storybook. Yeah. Basically, this was a run-on from the very edgy streetwear that we saw in the late 1960s. Remember, I was Lord Kitchener's valet, Granny Takes a Trip, all of that kind of thing, the nostalgia for Victorian and Edwardian stuff. Storybook, as I have decided to call this trend, was basically an Edwardian Victorian revival. Again, an extension of what we saw in the late 60s, but with the edge taken out of it. So we're thinking about a lot of lace here, a lot of whimsy, a sort of harking back to romantic and ladylike times. Let's take a look. Because the era was so horribly violent, there was a real trend towards gentleness, gentle pursuits, and the Edwardian slash Victorian era was seen as a very gentle, very ladylike, very delicate, sweet time. One of the crazes of the early 1970s particularly was pressing flowers. Everybody was pressing flowers. This, of course, was a very Edwardian pursuit, but it had a huge revival, kind of uh, like people were into scrap booking a couple of years ago. People were pressing flowers. There was a huge revival of Beatrix Potter. Do you know who Beatrix Potter was? She was an Edwardian author of children's novels, and she wrote about woodland animals like Peter Rabbit. It's all very sweet, it's all very gentle, but it's all very Edwardian, too. The movie The Railway Children came out in the early 1970s and was a huge international hit. It's a story about some Edwardian children who live near a railway in the countryside. It's very gentle stuff, and people were lapping this up. Take a look at this. This is not a mainstream fashion image. This is a high fashion image. In fact, the model on the right that you see there is going to be featured as one of our style icons of the decade in a second. This is another high fashion image. You can see totally whimsical, romantic, gentle, soft, lacy. And take a look at this. The designer that we associate with this uh, trend particularly is the designer who created the image, the clothes in the image in the middle there. Her name was Laura Ashley. Have you heard that name before? You should know it. Um, she really did trademark this trend. But everybody had their version of it. Saint Laurent had his version of it. Everybody had their version of it. And in a way, it was kind of lovely. Here is Twiggy. We're going to see quite a few images of Twiggy from the 70s, because remember, when her career started and everybody was talking about Twiggy, she was only 16, so she had a career as a model throughout the early 70s too. Look at what she's wearing, and look at that beautiful straw hat with the cherries on it. Every single female member of my family in the early 70s had this hat. And of course, it parlayed perfectly into lingerie as well. And just when we thought the trend was over, in 1978, this movie came out, Pretty Baby, starring a 12-year-old Brooke Shields as a prostitute, a child prostitute in New Orleans at the turn of the century. So, um, although this is a terrible movie. Of course, it is full of boudoir lace, boudoir Edwardian lace, and it 
help the trend uh, continue, really, until the... But by the time this trend hit the mainstream, you're not going to like this, let me tell you. You're not going to like this. We're going to do this for every 70s trend, and I'm going to show you what happened when it hit the mainstream. This is what happened when it hit the mainstream. Oh, take a look at the textiles. This is what I mean. The wrong textiles make all the difference. When it was at a trendy or high fashion level, it was always white or ivory or pearl. Look at this, yellow and pink. But it's the same trend. Here it is again. And look at the very wide collar there. Oh my God, it's so horrible. But you saw, it actually started as something, you know, really quite, quite lovely. And here is a prom picture. You can see what she's wearing there. It is the same trend. Yes, this is what happened to the 70s when it hit the mainstream. And this isn't the worst of it. Brace yourselves. The next trend up you are going to love. It's one of my favorites of all time, and in true 70s trend jargon, I have decided to call it Hooray for Hollywood. This was a pure nostalgic trend, an escape into past glamour. It was all part of the deco revival of the early 1970s. This is going to be very easy for me to explain to you because we've already done Art Deco. We did the 20s, we did the 30s. Here is Twiggy again. She doesn't look like that little mod kid on Carnaby Street anymore, does she? In her little Mary Quant A-line mini dress. The Deco revival again, an escape into the past, this time into the glamour of old Hollywood. So the interest in Victorian and Edwardian nostalgia we saw in the late 60s would explode in the 70s. We saw it with the Victorian Edwardian storybook trend, but this time the focus was on the late 20s, the 30s, and then, as you'll see, by mid-decade, the 1940s too. And there she is, looking very intentionally like who? Marlena Dietrich, I'd say. Her name was Barbara Hulaniki. She was of Polish descent, but completely British, terribly posh. And she was a, an incredibly gifted and visionary woman. Her label was not called Barbara Hulaniki. Her label was called Bieber. And this is so legendary, the Bieber name, know it. This is the quintessential Bieber look. It's so 30s, isn't it? Look at those Jean Harlow curls. Look at that big 1930s Riviera hat. This is one of the iconic Bieber t-shirts. Note the deco font, the deco graphic. Think black and gold when you think Bieber. Look at this Bieber evening dress. Incredible. If I put this on an exam and said, OK, date it, and you wrote 1930s, you know what? I couldn't blame you. Look at that Art Deco Bieber platform heel. This jacket is so 30s. I can look at it, and I know it's 70s, because I have a trained eye, and I'm Prof H. But... I wouldn't blame you if you thought it was 30s. Isn't it wonderful? And take a look at this suit. We're even getting into the 40s here, aren't we, with the peplum, the shoulder pads, and the A-line skirt. That's a little bit later in the Bieber story. But here is where the story really gets good, and it's sort of a cautionary tale for anyone working in fashion retail. Okay, Barbara had her little boutique 
in the 60s called Biba, a little boutique. Everybody had their little shop. Mary Quant had her boutique. There was Granny Takes a Trip. There was I Was Lord Kitchener's Valet. There was Mr. Fish and there was Bieber. But then, because she really saw this whole deco revival happening, she and her husband, who was her business partner, somehow, I have no idea how, because they were both just very young, they got the funding to rent an entire deco department store on Kensington High Street, which is in the center of London, a very trendy shopping street at the time. Here it is, formerly Barker's, just an old lady department store. They took it over and this was one of the biggest stories of fashion retail, I think. She launched Bieber, the department store. Here is a little promotional newspaper that was given out to announce the launch. Welcome to the new Bieber. Take a look at the typography. Take a look at the graphics. It is completely a playful nod, isn't it, to the 20s and 30s. Barbara offered complete escapism out of this horrible world of by the Meinhof and terrorism and all of this crap into the glamour of the 1930s. Look at this display. This is just one of the many counters on the six or seven floors of Bieber. I have been to Bieber many times. I went to Bieber often as a little girl because my sisters were Bieber girls. They both worked at Bieber. They are older than I am by about 10 years or so. And uh, so when I was a very little girl, they were teenagers and they had the coveted job of being Bieber shop girls. But look at this display. See the carpet? Barbara Haluniki had all of the carpets specifically and specially made to deck out this entire massive department store in this deco design. The ostrich feathers, I remember there was always this incredibly kind of heavy, exotic smell in Bieber. Take a look here. You can see this is a, um, a photograph, a fashion photograph of somebody wearing a very 1930s looking Bieber outfit, sort of 30s resort, but check out the doorway behind her. This is the Egyptian 20s revival, revived again for the deco revival of the early 70s. This is the cosmetics counter. Everything in Bieber was the Bieber label. Everything was Bieber. Cosmetics, homeware, everything. Bieber had its own nightclub. Imagine a department store with a nightclub. A 1930s style glamorous nightclub called the Rainbow Room, where they would have a big band orchestra playing or a pianist playing. This is where the in crowd went in the early 70s. This is where you'd find your Bianca Jagger. It's where you'd find your David Bowie. It's where you'd find, you'd find your whole glam rock crowd. The Rainbow Room at Bieber. Oh my God, the glamour and the escapism of it all. And one can only assume that people in the Rainbow Room dressed like this. I was too little to ever go to the Rainbow Room. Um, this is Twiggy again wearing Bieber. And I'm showing you this picture just to alert you to the high glamour, but also the return of animal print, of cheetah, of leopard. Where did we see that? We saw that in the 30s. Remember the African craze. Bieber revived this. And so uh, cheetah and leopard are one of the key um, motifs of the deco revival. Look at this. It looks like a record player, doesn't it? Well, it is sort of. But look at the shells. They are actual albums, LPs. So then you start to make sense. This was an enormous, oversized, old-fashioned record player. The records actually spun around and children could walk up those steps and sit on them. I remember doing that and then you could sort of spin around on it. 
This is the food department. Can you see what's happening here? Giant tins of sardines rolled back to uh, display the goods. Those of you interested in visual merchandising should really study Bieber. It's so incredible. This is the shoe department. You can imagine Marlena Dietrich swanning through here and buying some shoes. Everything was beautifully and ambiently lit so that you really felt you were in a 1930s movie. This is Barbara Haluniki herself. She is not in a park or a garden. She is on the roof of Bieber. They actually had a roof garden with a tea room and real pink flamingos. This is London. We don't have flamingos in London. But the roof garden of Bieber had real pink flamingos. It was that glamorous. Everything in Bieber was Bieber, down to their baked beans. When people talk about uh, Ralph Lauren being the first lifestyle brand, they're wrong. Bieber was the first lifestyle brand, and the lifestyle they were selling was one of old Hollywood glamour. Did you enjoy that? I hope you did. I love seeing creative fashion people at work, don't you? I find it so inspiring. And wasn't Bieber incredible? But you know what? Bieber was just the pinnacle of an enormous international fashion and cultural trend. Take a look at this layout. This features Faye Dunaway. You might recognize her who played Bonnie in Bonnie and Clyde. Everything she's wearing, of course, is part of the 1930s revival. Take a look at the polka dots on the left there. But also check out the typography and the graphics. Completely, completely 30s. This is Bieber again. Utterly, utterly in keeping with the whole revival. How glamorous. And please look at those metallic platform heels. Look at this on the right. It's Pat Cleveland, who, of course, was one of uh, the, the first African-American supermodels, a wonderful, wonderful uh, lady, a friend, I believe, of Professor Cockles. But look at what she's wearing. It's totally 1930s resort, isn't it? Look at her big palazzo pants and that enormous hat. We saw that when we did 30s resort, didn't we? But look at her companion. He's like Edward VIII. He's got his polka dot cravat. He's got his bigger uh, pants. So glamorous. Such an escape. I love this layout. It's uh, from the mid-70s. Look at the copy. Bright lips of yesteryear. The hat swoops like a piece of jet age architecture cartwheeling past the glossiest of red, red lips. The sleek fashion look of the 30s and 40s has resurfaced. Women with plucked brows are slipping into slinky halter neck dresses, wedgies and chubby jackets, while men are stepping out in two-toned shoes and bow ties. Believe me, this was a deliberate revival. This is Twiggy in the 60s, how we think of Twiggy, right, with those big childlike eyes. This is Twiggy in the Bieber era. Look at those plucked brows, that curly kind of Jean Harlow, soft 1930s hair, and that kind of very metallic sheen to her makeup. Everybody did this revival look. This is Diana Ross doing the 30s revival. It parlayed into movies as well. Here we have Jodie Foster in a very famous movie called Taxi Driver by Martin Scorsese. Guess what? She plays a child prostitute. We keep running into this in the 70s, don't we? Brooke Shields and Pretty Baby. Jodie Foster and Taxi Driver. That's not important. What's important is that she is wearing an adaptation of the Bieber look with that curly hair and the big hat and uh, her outfit in general, but take a look at those huge wedged shoes. There were many movies, some of the biggest movies of this uh, era, the early 70s, were set in the 20s or 30s, Paper Moon. This is a delightful movie set on the Dust Bowl during the Great Depression of the 30s, starring Ryan O'Neill and his own daughter, Tatum O'Neill. The Sting. This is a wonderful movie with Paul Newman and Robert Redford, a huge hit set in the 20s. Cabaret with Liza Minnelli, set in Weimar Berlin in the 1930s. And of course, Gatsby. 
the original version of Gatsby, although I believe there was actually a version before this one. But this was the most famous version of The Great Gatsby, starring Robert Redford and Mia Farrow, set in the 20s. So you see, this was huge. Here are the Pointer Sisters. They were a disco, a disco group. Look at this photograph. They are completely 1930s slash 40s nostalgia for this era. And look at this image of the actress Angelica Houston. Could you get more 20s than this? Now you can look at this and you will know that this is 70s revival. First of all, you know it because it's in color, but I think you could probably just tell. Basically, an easy way to tell the real 20s and 30s from the 70s revival is that the 70s revival had more color in it and uh, it had a slightly more playful approach. Well, after seeing all of that, would you like to be a beaver girl? Take a look at this. Beaver is looking for intelligent, attractive, hard-working girls who want to make a career for themselves. Oh my god, this is so 70s. We offer excellent and rapid promotional prospects, good starting salaries, one free meal per day in our staff restaurant, staff sauna bath. Yes, there was a sauna at Beaver as well. And a massive discount. Well, my sisters, as I just mentioned, did work at Bieber, and they had the time of their lives. But to work there, you had to have a certain look. The Bieber look became kind of a universal look for young, trendy girls in the early 70s. Let's find out how to get it. The Bieber look. Let's start with our girl. The in-class section of uh, fashion history and global attire have decided to call her Sarah. So let's call her Sarah. Let's turn Sarah into a beautiful Bieber girl. First thing, those very skinny arched brows that we last saw in the 1930s. Then, a very dark and smudgy eye with a lot of purples, a lot of russets, and a slight metallic sheen. Then glitter. Put it on the cheekbones as well. And then a very dark, very retro, glamorous lip. And then a red kind of henna color was preferable and a huge head of curls of hennaed 30s glamour curls and this was the Bieber look see what I mean it really became a standard for beauty look at her look at her eyebrows and look at her, even though the picture is in black and white, you can see she has the skinny brows, she has that kind of a glittery sheen on her eyelids. And this brings us to the style icon that we're going to link to the whole 30s, 40s glamour revival of the 70s. But in fact, it's a style icon couple. This couple. Oh my goodness. The Glamour. Jerry Hall and Brian Ferry. Who were they? Well, Jerry Hall was a model from Texas who was based in London, but she was the supermodel of the 70s. Take a look at her there. Oh my goodness, the Glamour. She was romantically linked for a while to Brian Ferry. He was the lead singer of the glam rock group Roxy Music. Look at them. Have you ever seen such a glamorous couple? Look at this image of the two of them. She is wearing a 1930s style suit with a little hat and look at him with the polka dot tie. Remember the polka dot craze of the 1930s. Just to drive home what a glamour couple they were. They were the it couple. Here they are on the cover of um, Men's Vogue. 
looking terribly glamorous. We've noticed, haven't we, that it couples, hot couples, are kind of a running theme, aren't they? Okay, we could say that uh, um, Henry II and Eleanor of Aqu Aquitaine were probably the first it couple. Oh no, hang on. What about Antony and Cleopatra? There are it couples constantly. In the 20th century, we saw Wallace Simpson and uh, Edward VIII, didn't we? Then, of course, there was Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, Serge Gainsbourg and Jane Birkin, and here we have Jerry Hall and Brian Ferry. They were so famous internationally for their embodiment of old Hollywood glamour. Side note, fun fact. I met uh, Brian Ferry once. I have been in Brian Ferry's home. I'll tell you the little story. Uh, a good friend of mine was working for Brian Ferry not so long ago. I'm talking 10 years ago, maybe, if that. Um, I was working in the fashion industry and living in Paris, and my friend was working um, for Brian Ferry as his PA. I was living in Paris. I went over to London to do some trend spotting, was going to have dinner with my friend, and he said, meet me at you know my place of work so you can meet brian ferry and uh, so i said sure i would love it and so i arrived at this big posh house in london and uh, rang the doorbell brian ferry answered i said i'm here for my friend and he said oh he's just gone to fedex come in brian ferry hottest guy of the 70s made me a cup of tea and gave me a cookie and we had a nice chat. You can't get fairer than that. Lovely bloke. Moving on. I should probably mention that Jerry Hall dumped Brian Ferry and took up with Mick Jagger. And they were together for a very long time and had children together, etc., etc. More fool her, I say, because he is lovely. All right, let's look at this glamorous Hollywood revival trend in the mainstream, because by the time it hit the mainstream, yeah, you're not going to like this either, let me tell you. Look at this shirt. Yes, you can see it's completely deco revival, but it's not really something Brian Ferry would wear, is it? Look at this. Yeah, it's kind of 30s, moving into the 40s. You can really see it's part of the same trend. But again, you can see the importance of textile. These dresses are polyester. It just doesn't work. And words fail me here. But you can see it as part of the same trend.
Our next 70s super trend, and this one really was huge and lasted throughout the decade in one incarnation or another, I am calling Caravan. Like a caravan of traders traveling along the Silk Road. It was gypsy, it was sometimes peasant, it was exotic. And it was always sort of the same, no matter what point of the 70s you pick up on it. Let's take a look. Basically, caravan was a kind of peasant blouse, a very full skirt, and a headscarf. And here it is again. And here it is again. Lots of uh, uh, interesting print, very exotic. Everyone had a version. This is Masoni's version. This was so dominant. This is Rhoda, a character from the Mary Tyler Moore show, in her version of this trend. This is Cher. We can always count on Cher to embrace every trend of every era. In her version of this trend, you see the kind of... Uh, this is an off-the-shoulder peasanty blouse, but with the headscarf. This was huge. This is Lanvin's version of it from the very early 70s, but you see the full skirt, the exotic print, and the headscarf. And this takes us to the designer of the decade. He didn't do it first, but my goodness, he did it best. And here he is. Do you recognize this rather attractive young man? This is Yves Saint Laurent. And can I just take this moment to remind you that everyone in fashion says Yves Saint Laurent. We know how to say his name, Yves Saint Laurent. You don't say Yves Saint Laurent or Yves Saint Laurent or anything like that. It's Yves Saint Laurent. You don't pronounce the T's and you don't say Saint or anything that sounds like it. It's Saint. Yves Saint Laurent. All right, cool. Please note the length of his hair here as well. Men in the 70s had quite long hair. Yves Saint Laurent had been famous for a very long time. He was famous in the 60s. But I really think it's the 70s where his genius uh, hit its greatest heights. Yves Saint Laurent was not a fashion innovator in the way that uh, Dior was, and of course Dior was uh, Yves Saint Laurent's mentor. He didn't invent anything, he didn't invent uh, the pantsuit, people give him credit for it with the smoking, which we'll look at in a second. His genius was this, he recognized what was happening on the street and he validated it with beautiful couture collections, beautiful ready-to-wear. And by validating it, he then made it acceptable to the masses. Yves Saint Laurent was a true fashion genius and he was a true artist. I have linked him in with the caravan trend, as I have dubbed it. He didn't do it first, but by God, he did it the most famously and the most beautifully with this. It was dubbed his rich Russian peasant collection. That was a joke. Peasants aren't rich, are they? But what he did, he took this sort of a, a ubiquitous at that point, uh, sort of peasant, gypsy look, exotic, and he really made it luxurious. He added this luxury element to it with this silk and this taffeta and this, this incredible palette. He drew on Russia and Russian textiles and furs. And look at that uh, um, jacket in the, the first image there, that fur-lined vest. It was sumptuous. This was um, fall 76. People have been doing this look since the early 70s. Lanvin did it in 1972. But it was Yves Saint Laurent who turned it into this absolutely luxurious flight of fantasy. And by doing so, he validated the trend. And then, boy oh boy, it hit the mainstream. 
He embraced exoticism to such an extent that the following year, of course, the perfume he launched was opium. It's all about the Silk Route, isn't it? The Silk Road exoticism. This whole caravan, gypsy, peasant, Russian thing. Let's see what happened when it hit the mainstream. You're not going to like this. There we go. It's the same trend, but look at it. It's awful. This is truly awful. And again, it's a question of textile as well as palette. Here it is again. It's the same trend. You have the, the flouncy sort of peasant blouse. You have the uh, overly uh, embellished skirt. But it doesn't work. And it sure as shit doesn't work here. And take a look here. Yes, it's all the same story, but it's just hideous. When Yves Saint Laurent did it, it was sumptuous, it was beautiful. Here, it's pig slop. Yes, pig slop. <laughs> the next 70s megatrend I want to talk to you about, I have dubbed I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar which of course is the opening line to the very famous song by Helen Reddy. It was the anthem of the women's liberation movement, women's lib of the early 1970s. You know this song, right? If you don't, I'll just sing the first couple of lines to remind you. It goes like this. I am woman, hear me roar, in numbers too big to ignore, and I know too much to go back and pretend. I am woman, hear me roar, in numbers too big to ignore. Yes, this is the women's liberation movement. The women's liberation movement, women's libbers, picked up in the 70s where the suffragettes had left off in the 1910s. Remember the suffragettes campaigned and fought for our right to vote, us women? Well, the women's liberation movement were fighting for female equality. Why weren't women paid the same as men for doing the same jobs? I love this. This is a women's liberation movement protest march. We are the 51% minority. It's kind of a joke. Obviously, 51% of the population is not a minority. And yet women were treated like they were a minority paid like they were a minority. The two leading figures of the women's liberation movement are these two rather righteous looking ladies here. I want you to be aware of them, to know their names. Every educated person knows who these two women are. The first is Gloria Steinem. And this lady is Dorothy Pittman Hughes. They were writers, intellectuals, advocates. They were the uh, sort of public face of the women's liberation movement. And you know what? This is a very famous photo of them fighting the fight for female equality. And guess what, guys? They are still fighting the fight. Do you know why? Because women in the United States are still paid 79 cents to the dollar compared to what men earn. Unbelievable, but true. But the women's liberation movement would impact fashion hugely. Sure, you see a lot of polyester here. Let's excuse that. Women wearing pants. You might find this hard to believe, but at, as late as 1978, there were restaurants in New York that would not allow women in trousers to enter. Which brings me to our mega trend, the pantsuit. All right, you know as well as I do 
That women had been wearing pants since the 20s. We saw that wonderful image of Louise Brooks wearing pants. Do you remember that? In the 20s. And then, of course, Marlene Dietrich, Greta Garbo, and all of those wonderful palazzo pants in the 1930s. Women in the 40s wore pants, didn't they? Uh, in the 50s, do you remember that suburban wear we looked at with the capri pants? So women have always worn pants, which is why it pisses me off when people who really don't know fashion history but think they do say that, oh, it was Yves Saint Laurent in 1966 who invented pants. Of course he didn't. But Yves Saint Laurent in 1966 launched Le Smoking, like smoking jacket, which was a pantsuit for women. It was luxury. And remember we just discussed Saint Laurent's genius was to take um, various trends either on the street or in Hollywood or here or there, make them luxurious, make them beautiful, and make them acceptable to the masses by doing so. So Yves Saint Laurent launched Le Smoking in 1966, but we know that pants and pantsuits had been around for a very long time. Before that, however, it was in the 1970s, incumbent with the women's liberation movement, with women really wanting to be taken seriously in the workplace, that the pantsuit took off as a mega trend. Here is a very high fashion uh, uh, pantsuit. You can imagine somebody going to the Rainbow Room at Bebo wearing this, but you know what? Everybody at every level of retail had pantsuits. You would have had pantsuits. I would have had pantsuits. In fact, I did have pantsuits. I was a five in 1970 and 14 in 1979, and I remember having pantsuits at various points. You know, if we were going somewhere smart, I'd put on my pantsuit. This was really a drive for women wanting to feel equal, to feel powerful, and um, ready for work in a way that they weren't going to have their legs looked at by guys, right? This was women wanting to be taken seriously as a force to be reckoned with, and quite rightly, everybody had pantsuits. And this brings us to the style icon we're going to tie in with the liberated woman in the workplace and the pantsuit. This young lady here. Her name was Mary Tyler Moore. She was a television actress and the star of the most popular TV show of the 1970s, The Mary Tyler Moore Show. The actress is called Mary Tyler Moore. Her TV show, her sitcom was called The Mary Tyler Moore Show, but she played a character called Mary Richards. And the backstory to Mary Richards' uh, life was that she had, you know, grown up in the Midwest and had gone to college and she was educated and beautiful and all of this kind of stuff. But of course, look at the era. You go to college, why? So you can find a better husband. And the backstory is that she either got jilted at the altar or she jilted her fiancé at the altar. We don't see any of this. But then decides to break out as an independent career girl, a single woman on the rise. And she moves to Minneapolis, Minneapolis St. Paul, and gets a job as an assistant producer on a small, small fry local TV news station. It's hilarious. You should really watch the Mary Tyler Moore show. It's on YouTube. It's on everywhere. All the streaming devices. It was so famous. And it was groundbreaking because never before had there been a TV show that starred a single woman. Remember Lucy in the 50s? I Love Lucy. She was married, wasn't she? The Mary Tyler Moore show was about a single woman. It was the first TV show ever to feature a gay character, so that's pretty cool. It was the first TV show ever to uh, suggest or discuss a single woman having sex. That was shocking, but it's also hilariously funny. And it had a very strong female cast. 
The woman you see there, the young lady you see there on the right, is uh, the actress Valerie Harper, who plays Mary's best friend, who lives upstairs, who is a visual merchandiser in the TV show, actually. And we saw her a little bit earlier when we, when we were doing the caravan trend, remember? Um, and her character was you know, supposed to be very trendy and uh, trend forward, as we say today. The character you see on the left is her landlady, who uh, is married and trying to live a very traditional 50s life, while these other two girls are embracing the liberation of the 70s. But here's the thing. People were obsessed with what Mary Tyler Moore wore. She really guided women as to what was appropriate but stylish workwear. Like this terrific pantsuit here. And this one here, oh my God, Mary Tyler Moore as Mary Richards really genuinely had a fashion influence. And I'll prove it to you, this is not Mary Tyler Moore. But look at this outfit and look at the hair. And they've even cast a model who looks pretty much like Mary Tyler Moore. This is just uh, an image from a 1970s fashion magazine. So I wanted you to be aware of the influence and impact that television has. But also I wanted you to be aware of Mary Tyler Moore because I would love you to watch this show. It's really genuinely funny, I promise you. Another style icon who I want to link in to this uh, women appropriating menswear trend is this girl, Annie Hall. You'll notice I put Annie Hall in quotation marks because Annie Hall is a character as played by Diane Keaton in the romantic comedy by Woody Allen, Annie Hall. Look at the way she is dressed. Here she is in motion saying la di da which is what the kooky character of Annie Hall would say when she didn't know what else to say, la di da This look, uh, Diane Keaton's wardrobe for Annie Hall became a massive fashion trend. It taps in to the 1920s, 1930s nostalgia, doesn't it? But a nostalgia for menswear. You see, look at her tie and her vest and her hat and her baggy pants. This became a huge fashion trend in a decade devoted to trends. Here we have a simplicity pattern book. Look at those images, completely Annie Hall. Take a look at her with the man's tie and the baggy pants. Here it is again, the Annie Hall look, very nostalgic, but nostalgic for menswear. And on the image I just showed you, take a look at the Oxford bags. Remember, we met the Oxford bags in the 20s, didn't we? And of course, Sarah Jessica Parker as Carrie Bradshaw paid homage to the Annie Hall look, as it was genuinely known in the 70s in Sex and the City. But of course, men were going to react to all this, weren't they? Come on. Women wanting equal pay, wearing men's clothes. And I want to talk to you about a huge trend in kind of mainstream menswear in the 1970s, machismo. You know, like as in macho. You see a lot of this, very tight pants so that, you know, a gentleman's, what should we call them, family jewels can be best enjoyed. <laughs> a lot of hairy chests, very macho with medallions. Um, shirts left unbuttoned or buttoned very low so you can see the hairy chests because they are men and the medallion. This is a pop star Andy Gibb. But um, without meaning to put too fine a point on it, and uh, sorry for the uh, <laughs> double entendre there, but take a look at his uh, family jewels. Very tight pants on men to show, hey, they were guys. Take a look at that. 
and moustaches. This is Burt Reynolds, one of the biggest stars of the era. Moustaches. Why? Because moustaches are manly and masculine. This whole idea of men having hairy chests and medallions and tight pants to show their family jewels and a moustache to show they were guys. It really was kind of a reaction, very unconscious, of course, to the women's liberation movement and the pantsuit.